Hello. You know, there's nothing like a bit of fishing to unwind at the end of a busy week. And I'm lucky enough to be here fishing on one of the most famous lakes in the whole world. In fact, this lake is actually called a sea. This is the Sea of Galilee in Israel. Now, the reason I'm here is because about 2,000 years ago, around this lake, some really strange things happened. And you can read all about it in this book. Now, this is the world's bestseller. It's also one of the most unread books in all of history. It's the Bible, and it's all about this man who was born about 80 miles away from where I am right now. He was a carpenter. He said and he did really amazing things. And as a result, he got killed. Well, his life, more than any others, changed the course of history, so much so that most of the world now sets their calendar according to the date of his birth. And now, 2,000 years later, all around the world, there are millions of people who call themselves Christians who follow him. Now, we've all heard his name, even if it's just as a swear word. But who is he? Who is this Jesus Christ, anyway? Who do I think Jesus was? I think that he was a man who was spiritually enlightened. Someone who helped people and they liked him a lot. Jesus? No idea. I don't really know. Sorry. He's just a messenger of God. <laughs> That's quite a question. He saved a lot of people and he's a real good guy. I certainly think he was something special. <laughs> I'm scared. A religious icon. He was just a bloke that started preaching to people about God and that. Uh, the saviour of all mankind. I haven't got a clue. I think he was a good bloke, just like any other good bloke. A person that's come down to help us all. Jesus is the son of God. Yeah, our saviour. A famous person that people believe in. Oh, crumbs. Uh, the son of God, isn't he? No? <laughs> Now, people have got all kinds of ideas about who Jesus really was. But I mean, anyway, so what? He did live a very long time ago. I mean, is there anyone today who's really all that interested in who Jesus is? Well, here's one or two. I've always believed in Jesus, but I think initially he was more of a Santa Claus kind of character to me. Um, but as I've gone through life, he's become so much more real to me in everyday situations. I went to Sunday school for quite a few years as a child um, and enjoyed it, it was good fun. But it wasn't until I was about 16 that Jesus became a real person to me. I realised how much he loved me and from then I've spent time learning more about him, what he said and what he did. I was born in the Pacific Island, Western Samoa and came to New Zealand at a young age. And whilst I was at school, uh, it was there that I come to believe Jesus and ever since then in my international career as an all black and coming to the UK Jesus has certainly been the biggest influence in my life. Well I've believed in Jesus since I was a teenager. Um, I've been going through quite a difficult time because my parents had split up when I was younger and knowing that there was a God out there who loved me was really important to me. For most of my life I thought going to church and all that Jesus stuff was only for good people and I was far from being good. In fact I ended up in prison for trying to kill someone. While I was there, I experienced Jesus for the first time. And now, I'm a real believer. Most of us have had our lives affected by Jesus, and we probably don't even realize it. Life today is far better than it used to be, and that's partly because, in the past, there were men and women who actually did the things that Jesus taught. People like Elizabeth Fry. 200 years ago, Prison was described as hell on earth, especially for women. So she worked hard to improve their conditions. The changes she began continue to this day. At the same time, Lord Shaftesbury used his wealth and political influence to make life better for the poor and needy. He also fought hard to end the cruel practice of making children work down mines. Street kids aren't new, 150 years ago, Orphans and those with disabilities often had no one to look after them. 
until Dr. Thomas Bernardo opened special homes where they could be cared for, a work that still goes on today. British ships were among those that took African men and women to America where they were sold into slavery. William Wilberforce was one of many Christians who campaigned to end the slave trade, which happened in 1833. And just over a hundred years later, a Baptist pastor, himself the descendant of a slave, peacefully campaigned for equal rights for his fellow black Americans. His name, Dr. Martin Luther King. So how does someone who lived 2,000 years ago actually change the lives of people living today? Well, in order to understand that, you've got to come here, because this is where Jesus got his first ever followers. They were fishermen who worked on this lake. How you doing? Hi. Let me tell you about them. There was a gang of them, and their leader was called Simon. And Jesus gave him a nickname, Peter. It comes from the Greek word Petra, means rock. Got a bunch of working guys, and the nickname of the ringleader is Rocky. I think you know the sort of men I'm talking about here. They were tough. You would not mess with them. They would not have been easily impressed. But when they met Jesus, there was something about him that impressed them so much they gave up their homes, their families, their jobs, everything, and followed him for the rest of their lives. So what we know about Jesus right from the start is this. He had the kind of power and charisma that got that sort of response from these sort of men. So just who was Jesus? Well, the answer is all bound up in the history of this country, Israel. It goes back many thousands of years, and it's every bit as exciting as a Hollywood blockbuster. It's the story of how, beginning with just one man, a nation was born. That one man was Abraham, and he lived over 4,000 years ago in a land that we now call Iraq. Abraham believed that God spoke to him and made him a promise. He said, Abraham, if you trust me, if you do what I command, I will make you the father of a great nation, a nation with a land of its own, a land filled with good things, the promised land. In these days, people believed that their lives were ruled by powerful spirits. They made models of them out of gold and silver, and they all had names. Now, these idols, were what they worshipped, but they were terrified of them. They thought that by sacrificing animals and even their children to them, these spirits would be pleased and give them good harvests and success against their enemies. But the people that God spoke to Abraham about were going to be different. No spirits, no superstition, no idols, just God himself who'd be with them and be their king. And they would be called the chosen people because through them, God was planning to bless the entire world. So Abraham took God at his word and trusted him. And then his descendants increased until there were 12 tribes of them, or clans. Now, I'm going to skip an awful lot of history here, but eventually these 12 tribes became a small nation. And the nation was called Israel after Abraham's grandson, who was the father of the 12 tribes. Now these tribes, this people, this nation, they became known as Jews. And one of the special things about the Jews was they had laws. God gave the law to a man called Moses. Moses was one of the early leaders of the people of Israel. And the law was given on top of a mountain, Mount Sinai. We know these laws as the Ten Commandments. Now the first one was, you should love God and make him number one in your life. And the rest, they were really rules about behavior, kind of code of conduct, if you like. There were things you shouldn't do. You shouldn't lie or steal, murder or cheat. These laws were really designed for the care and the protection of the people. They had hundreds of extra laws as well for everything from buying and selling property, how you should treat animals, how you should treat the poor, even laws about personal cleanliness. Now, as well as laws, the people had priests. All the priests came from one particular tribe and they had a special job. They had to act as a kind of go-between, between God and the people. 
and there were prophets. Now to be chosen by God to be one, well that was really something. They were men and women who were God's mouthpiece, if you like. Through them, he told the people what would happen in the future. He also gave warnings through them when the people were disobedient and sometimes when the people were discouraged, God would speak through his prophets to comfort them and remind them of his love. Do you want to know the really sad thing about this chosen people? They almost always rejected the God who'd chosen them. Even when Moses was receiving the Ten Commandments on the top of the mountain, down below, while the people waited, they made a golden calf and they worshipped it. Time and time again, these people turned their backs on God and chose to go their own way. And time and time again, God spoke through his prophets, encouraging them to turn back. And time and time again, the people refused. You see, the real problem was in the heart of the people. You could call it stubbornness, you could call it rebellion. Call it what you like, in the end, the Bible calls this sin. Sometimes it was through weakness, sometimes it was deliberate, but in the end, the result was the same. People got cut off from their relationship with God. They forgot about him. So God withdrew his blessing, and then the harvest would fail. Then their enemies would attack them and they'd be beaten. The people suffered. But here's the amazing thing, all the way through the history of this nation, God makes one thing very, very clear. The relationship can be restored if the people will do two things. First of all, they've got to repent. That means they've got to change their heart, their attitude towards God. And secondly, they have to sacrifice an animal. Now, this is really important because God is in effect saying this, look, you've sinned, you've destroyed our relationship and you've done wicked things and you deserve to die. But if you kill that animal, I'm gonna accept that death instead. That animal will be your substitute. Now, sometimes a bull was killed, other times a goat, but most often it was a lamb. In a special ceremony, hands were laid on the animal as a sign of transferring the people's sins onto it, and then it was killed with as little pain as possible. The meat was cooked and then eaten at a great feast. Now, all this happened in the temple. When God saw the sacrifice, his broken friendship was healed and his blessings began to flow again. Now, to you and me, this seems like a really barbaric thing to do. But it's worth remembering this. The meat in most of our supermarkets comes from animals that have been treated far more cruelly than this. And that's worth remembering when we think of ourselves as more civilized today. You see, the fact is, for people living thousands of years ago in Israel, this was a central part of their understanding of their relationship to God. Now, at the same time as all this animal sacrifice, God started to speak again through his prophets about another sort of sacrifice. This one was going to happen a long time in the future and it wouldn't be an animal. This time, it was going to be a man and this man was going to offer himself willingly as a sacrifice for sins and not just the sins of Israel, the sins of the whole world. He was going to be the Lamb of God. There are hundreds of prophecies about him. This is a really famous one from the prophet Isaiah. It was written about 3,000 years ago. But because of our sins, he was wounded, beaten because of the evil we did. We are healed by the punishment he suffered, made whole by the blows he received. All of us were like sheep that were lost, each of us going his own way. But the Lord made the punishment fall on him, the punishment all of us deserved. All through the early history of Israel, the people of God were waiting for the Messiah to appear. In fact, there were lots of ways you could recognize him when he did appear. For instance, it was prophesied that he was going to be from Nazareth, although he'd be born in Bethlehem, and his birth would bring great sorrow to the people of that region. So you can understand the people's excitement when after hundreds of years of waiting and watching, a strange-looking man called John came on the scene. He told everyone to get ready for the coming of the Lord. John was a prophet. He was also off the planet. He lived in the wilderness eating only locusts and wild honey. 
His clothes were made from camel's hair, but God had chosen him to tell everyone that the Messiah was coming. From all over the place, people came to the River Jordan to hear him. He was the hottest thing in Israel. He told them to change the way they lived. And those who wanted to, he baptized as a sign that their sins were washed away. But always his message was that someone far more powerful was coming. Someone so great that he wasn't even good enough to untie his sandals. So the people of God waited and they waited and they watched and then one day as John was baptizing it happened. Now this is how the Bible records it. The next day John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, there is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is the one I was talking about when I said, a man is going to come after me who's greater than I am because he existed before I was born and I didn't know who he would be, but I came baptizing with water in order to make him known to the people of Israel. Now Jesus and John were both about 30 years old when this happened. And in fact, they were related, they were cousins. They'd probably played together when they were kids. But it was the way that Jesus was born that marked him out as something special. Do you remember the prophecies that the man to be sacrificed would come from here in Nazareth, but he'd be born in Bethlehem? Well, hundreds of years have passed, and these prophecies are about to come true in a very unusual way. There was a girl called Mary, and she lived here in Nazareth, and she was engaged to a man called Joseph. Now, in those days, they didn't believe in sex before marriage. They hadn't slept together. Mary was a virgin. And then Joseph finds out that she's pregnant. So he assumes the worst. She's cheated on him, and he decides to call the wedding off. In fact, under Jewish law, he's obliged to do that. But then, at night, he has a dream. An angel of God appears to him and says, Joseph, don't be afraid. Mary's pregnant by the power of the Spirit of God, and she's going to have a baby boy, and you are going to call him Jesus because he's going to save his people from their sins. In those days, Israel was part of the mighty Roman Empire. And every 14 years or so, a census took place for military and taxation purposes. Now, although Jews didn't have to do military service, surprise, surprise, they had to pay tax. That meant that every man had to go to his hometown to register to pay this tax. Now, for Mary and Joseph, that meant an 80-mile trip by donkey, just as Mary was about to go into labour. Right, I've parked my donkey round the corner because this is where archaeologists believe the first real Christmas happened. This is where Jesus was actually born. They built a church to mark the place, but uh, believe me, this is nothing like it was then. When Mary and Joseph arrived at Bethlehem, they tried to get a room in the local inn, but it was full up. Actually, in those days, they didn't have single rooms. They had a kind of big room like a dormitory, and everyone sort of slept in it together. But when the landlord saw the condition Mary was in, he said, all right, come on, I'll try and make some space for you in the stables round the back. Now, actually, it would have been a cave, a bit like this. At least here, Mary would be kept warm with the animals, and she'd have some privacy while she gave birth. So that's how Jesus came to be born in Bethlehem, though he was from Nazareth.
Jerusalem. It's the capital city of Israel, and it was capital when Jesus was born. I'm at the museum of the Tower of King David, and it's built on the ruins of the citadel. This is where King Herod had his palace. Herod was king when Jesus was born, and he was a paranoid maniac. When he heard a rumor that a child had been born in Bethlehem who was going to be the king of the Jews, he decided to try and have him killed. But then, Joseph had another one of his dreams. And in the dream, the angel of the Lord said, Joseph, take Mary and Jesus and get out of Bethlehem. Go and hide in Egypt. So they did. Then when Herod found out that Jesus had escaped, he went berserk. He ordered every baby boy around Bethlehem to be killed. So the birth of Jesus did bring great sorrow to that region, just as the prophets had said. It wasn't until Herod died that Mary and Joseph felt safe enough to bring Jesus back to Nazareth. This is where Jesus grew up with his brothers and sisters. He was part of a poor family, they had to count the pennies, and eventually Jesus became a carpenter just like Joseph. Now this part of Nazareth is where today's carpenters do their work. Let me introduce you to someone. This is Loai. Hi. Hello. Loai works here in Nazareth as a carpenter. He's 27, exactly the same age as Jesus when Jesus was working here, making furniture, farming implements. See, that's the whole point. Jesus was just a normal working guy, and the people hanging out with him had no idea that he was someone who was going to change the world. When Jesus was baptized, something really amazing happened to him. This is how the Bible puts it. After all the people had been baptized, Jesus was also baptized. And while he was praying, heaven was opened. And the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my own dear son. I am pleased with you. This was the start of Jesus' mission, and it was to last only three years. Now, if you were starting a movement and you wanted to change the world, who would you get to head it up? Well, you'd need some people who are rich for a start, because you're going to have to finance the whole thing, and then you're going to need some PR people, some people with political savvy, marketing skills. And you probably need a few celebrities, like musicians, actors, just to give some endorsement to your movement, give it some mass appeal. And who does Jesus choose? Some fisherman, a tax collector, a freedom fighter, and then an accountant who later betrays him. Anyway, Jesus had 12 close followers. They were called his disciples. And over the next three years, he was to teach and train these men to go everywhere and tell everyone about the kingdom of God. <laughs> They went everywhere together, including a wedding here at Cana. Now in Israel, they really know how to celebrate. Weddings can go on for days and they're fantastic parties. This is a special one taking place right here in Cana. The bride and groom are Jews from the Yemen. Now, halfway through the wedding that Jesus was at, disaster struck because they ran out of wine. Now, Mary, Jesus' mother, was there, and the waiters went to her and said, what are we going to do? And she said, right. You see that man over there? And they said, yeah. That's Jesus, my son. Go to him, do whatever he tells you. So they went over to Jesus, said, OK, you know about this wine situation. What are we going to do? And Jesus said, right. You see these jars? Now, there would have been six of them. About this size, they each hold about 100 litres. And the waiter said, yeah, yeah, we see the jars. He said, right, go and fill them up with water. So they looked at each other and thought, well, he must know what he's doing, so off they go. And they filled them up with water. They come back to him. OK, we've done it. What do we do now? Jesus says, right, go and serve a cup to the man in charge of the feast. 
and the waiters thought he is a complete lunatic. We've got nothing to lose, why don't we just do it? So they handed a cup to the man in charge of the feast, and he had a sip. This is a bit strange, where are the waiters? And the waiters thought, oh no, we're really in trouble now. And he said, you've got this completely wrong. What you normally do is bring the good wine out first, wait till everyone gets a bit drunk, and then bring the rubbish out. This is easily the best wine I've ever tasted. You've got it completely wrong. Cheers. So, not only did Jesus 